So thank you for having me. Diana um, has known Cornerstone um, since we were a napkin. And um, really, I mean, that's what it was. It was a napkin on an airplane um, that led to, to our uh, founding. Um, I should start by saying that um, when I was about five years old, uh, my dad, who was a lawyer, was a securities lawyer, um, we were talking and I was trying to understand, you know, Daddy, what, what do you do? And he said, well, part of what I do is that I understand that when you're on the phone with a client or with an investor, on your word, you can transact millions of dollars in business on your word, on your honor. And so I learned as a kid that honor and trust and transparency um, were critically important. And I just knew that. And I knew from the time that I was five years old that I would be a stockbroker. I had no idea what a stockbroker was, but I liked the word. So I'm gonna be a stockbroker. But the most important thing is honor. And so when I come these days to the markets, um, I should say, and I think we're all like this in here, I think that capitalism is beautiful. I think that economics is poetry. And I think that finance can be magic if you use it right. Black magic, if not so much. And so when I think about capitalism, what makes me crazy is notwithstanding the fact that it's the best system the world has ever known for creating value and prosperity, it has been distorted beyond recognition. And I actually think that's a sin. Again, it remains the best system we've got. And to deal with the challenges today, in education, in healthcare, in climate, in animals, in water, in the seas, we need to move trillions of dollars, not millions, not billions, we need to move trillions. And you cannot do that without the private sector, without healthy institutions. So again, I love capitalism. Um, by the way, Jim from Tom's uh, used a quote that is very near and dear to my heart. And I'm gonna tell you um, exactly what the quote is, um, but it is it, the Rabbi Hillel. And Rabbi Hillel said, that if I am not for me, then who will be? But if I am only for me, then what am I? And if not now, then when? So Jim, thank you for reminding me. That's a beautiful quote, and it actually defines capitalism really beautifully. It's okay to make profits, but you have to think long term. And I think you have to think about financial capital, human capital, natural capital, all the capitals that we want to make profit from. So when it comes to capitalism, economics, and finance, I want to turn to economics because that economics is a beautiful construct. It's a framework for how we think about things, right? And so when we go back to some of the very well-known economists, let's start with Adam Smith. Everyone thinks of the wealth of nations and the invisible hand and that by doing business, there will be unintended positive consequences. He didn't so much talk about the negative consequences. And probably the reason was, um, he was an optimist. And people don't remember that before the wealth of nations came his most important volume, I would say, which is the theory of moral sentiments. And that's where Adam Smith talks about the fact that human beings are exquisitely interested in the prosperity, in the circumstances of others. And so that's the good stuff of economics that we've gotten so far away from. So anyway, in talking about capitalism, what I'll tell you, again, is it's beautiful, it's powerful, it's been messed up, and we can fix it. And this is the really good part. And notwithstanding the fact that we have to move trillions, that we're investing about a third as much as we need to in alternative energies and climate, notwithstanding the fact that millions and millions of children are dying from dysentery, millions and millions of widows are being persecuted horribly because their husbands died, notwithstanding the fact that we are losing thousands of species every year, 
and we could be one of them at some point. Notwithstanding all that, I'm an optimist. We, <laughs> we have what we need to fix it, okay? We can learn about sea butterflies with help which, which can revitalize washed out corals. We have technologies where we can filter water to a billionth of a millimeter. We're getting into a place where we're bringing down the cost of alternative energy, solar storage, all the stuff we need to have. The one thing that we don't maybe have yet, which we're getting, is the force of will. And again, it's coming. And so this is what I want to tell you about kind of the pieces of the capital markets that are all coming together right now, which makes me optimistic. So, in the capital markets, it is rare that you have a confluence of structural events happening again at the same time, confluence. Okay, systems thinking, systems change is what we need if we're gonna repair capitalism and, and move trillions. So, the systems of the capital markets have these pieces. All right, there are the asset owners, there are the asset managers, there's the investment banks, there's the corporations, there's the accountants, the exchanges, there are the regulatory bodies, the academic bodies, right? All these pieces are starting to come together in a place where we know that we need more transparency, more honesty, and luckily, there's some other stuff going on that's gonna help us get there, right? It's unprecedented that we have that confluence. It's also unprecedented the extent of transparency that we have in the world, all right, with, with social media. If a company's gonna do something, they might as well be transparent about it because we're gonna hear about it like this. So transparency thanks to social media, that's unprecedented. So big data, this is a whole other area where we need to think about policy and intentionality. But big data, all right, AI, machine learning, ultimately quantum computing, it's going to allow us to use all the data points out there around environmental, social, and governance disclosures of companies. That big data capability is going to turn noise into insight. That's unprecedented. We're also to a time, we're at a time when, you know, we've talked about this for a while, people hear about this massive intergenerational transfer of wealth, all right, from the current generation into the millennial uh, cohort. Um, that intergenerational transfer of wealth doesn't happen tomorrow. They don't have the same birthday. But it's happening. It's happening, and the, the thoughtfulness, and the conscientiousness, and the demand for authenticity, all right, and clarity, it's coming. So that is unprecedented. From the standpoint of the regulatory environment, unprecedented in its complexity. From the standpoint of trust in our institutions, unprecedented in terms of how damaged they are, or the trust is. So all this stuff is unprecedented. And when things converge, when there is a confluence of this many things, then excuse me, but shit happens, right? So stuff is happening now. Money is starting to move. And to me, that's enormously exciting. But it has to be a systems change, right? There has to be aligned incentives. There has to be good information. There has to be transparency. And ultimately, there has to be trust, right? Great organizations, innovative organizations, if there's one thing there has to be there, is trust. So I think with everything going on, we're gonna start to see a rebuild of trust in our institutions. I would argue that the corporate sector is ahead of the investment sector, which is ahead of the regulatory sector in terms of making progress. So again, I'm very excited about what's going on. By the way, in terms of my firm, in terms of Cornerstone, what we are trying to do is to bring in kind of an institutional research, investment research heritage to a field that has been perceived maybe as ideological, politicized, or divisive. What we do, our investment advice, is about enhanced analytics and pragmatism. And so we can bridge the gap between kind of traditional investment committees and portfolio managers and boards and the new world of investing. 
right? I would argue that to not systematically integrate environmental, social, and governance factors into the investment process, I would argue that that is a breach of fiduciary duty. Why would you not want more information rather than less? Why would you not want a better risk-reward profile? Um, can I pause for a minute? Could, could those of you, because uh, again, I just want to know where everybody is. Um, if you know what impact investing is, or sustainable investing, let's use those two definitions right now, could you raise your hand? All right, so it's pretty good swath. And so we all know that impact investing, sustainable investing, SRI, double bottom line, triple bottom line, values-based investing, whatever you want to call it, it's just investing. These days I do like the term impact investing because it implies intentionality and measurability. And the one thing we really try to add, although it's a little presumptuous, I think, is additionality. But for our investments, but for facilitating this particular initiative, something wouldn't happen. So I really like that term, impact investing. And the issue, if somebody, if anyone wants to talk about it, we can probably talk about it offline for days, but measuring impact, we're all gonna talk about that again another time because it's a very detailed discussion, measuring impact. And there's no answers. And by the way, if anyone tells you, I got it. I know how to measure impact. Go running in the other direction because frankly, they're either lying or they're stupid because what I, what I can tell you is nobody knows exactly how to do it. It is a matter of putting frameworks together the way economics allows you to do it. We like a framework that is about access. Access to clean energy, access to water, access to education, access um, to mobility, access to broadband, right? Access, access, access. So when you think of that as an investor, you know, think about what's your money doing? And again, I would argue that all investing has impact. By the way, can I ask, it's a little personal, a little personal, but how many of you have invested your assets, say more than 50% of them, sustainably or with impact? All right, so it's a new game. I loved seeing some of you are doing it, but I think some people think this is hard. This is hard. I will give up competitive economic returns, right? There's still some people that think it's not competitive, again, in terms of, you know, what's going on out there. I'm breaking a fiduciary duty of care. What you will find when we dig deep into the empirical evidence is we can put those away. They're myths. You can actually be intentional, going after your values, and earning market rate returns. So this is something that's really important and it's new. So your responses are pretty much, you know, consistent with what we see out there. And that makes you think, okay, we got a lot of opportunities. So I think it's great. So in any case, um, I wanted to talk for a minute about impact entrepreneurship. So I wear a lot of hats. I was just wearing my capital markets hat. And by the way, it was always such a privilege to manage hundreds and hundreds of investment analysts and strategists and economists who told me they know everything about everything. And, um, and they thought they did. And so what I used to do um, is I would be a little bit subversive, all right? Because on Wall Street, there was, and there still is a perception, that if you do sustainable investing and impact investing, you're tree-hugging, ideological, and not serious about finance. I am serious as a heart attack about finance and investing. So what I did was I was a little subversive use the language of finance, the language of Wall Street, the language of revenues and costs and risk, and turn issues of sustainability into the language of finance, which it's not hard to do once you get yourself educated. It's critical to know that, um, obviously, for a mining company, stakeholders are important. For a finance company, governance is particularly important. For a semiconductor company, water is particularly important, given what they do. 
right? So none of the, the word sustainability doesn't have to be there. So the bottom line is this is fundamental investment research. Everyone's going to get there, and we're all going to be able to deploy our money in a really, really constructive way. And again, it has to be trillions. So um, I wanted to say a word about, this is a little crazy. So does everyone know what the SDGs are, the Sustainable Development Goals? Okay. So the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, are 17 categories of the huge things we have to fix, from poverty to the oceans to gender equality, everything. So I had to do a thing, like a webinar, on SDG 16. And that is world peace. And so I felt like, okay, so like, this is like I'm running for Miss America and I have to talk about world peace. But here's the thing. I actually do believe that healthy capital markets can lead to world peace. You know, we are talking about Syria, all right, as a water crisis, and how do you make that connection? We are talking about education, which is so critically important for revenues <laughs> going forward. So world peace. And the interesting thing about world peace is the kind of collaboration and trust we need, you know, makes me think of um, Golda Meir. And Golda Meir made the comment that until we love our children more than we hate our enemies, we will not have world peace. And the truth is, economic prosperity makes for an environment where we don't have to hate anybody, and it does get you towards world peace. And when I think about the capital markets, um, I think about the issue of um, what money means. So to me, money is a tool. It's been mentioned before today. And it's a very, very powerful tool. And with money, you can get to a place where you can find freedom. And when you think about what does freedom mean? You know, I think about um, FDR and his second inaugural address. And FDR talked about the essence of freedom. He talked about the four freedoms. Freedom of speech. Freedom of worship. Freedom from fear. And freedom from want. So when you think about healthy capitalism, about transparency, about analysis, about trust, about investing, you can think about world peace and freedom. And by the way, that's not what I talked about when I was grilling an analyst at the Investment Review Committee. <laughs> I was talking about investment research. So we can move our money in such a way that we're aligning our values and our wealth. And we can be stewards for the capital of the world. Financial capital, human capital, and natural capital. So on that note, I'm gonna leave it to you. We, I think we have time for a couple of questions. And then we're doing a lunch session specifically on impact investing. Um, so thank you very much, happy to be here. So what we've, everyone does it differently, all right? So when we talk about measuring impact, let's say, you know, you have uh, a million dollars and you're putting it into a water filtration technology, and so that's the input, right? And then the output from the water uh, filtration technology is cleaner water, and then the outcome is that cleaner water is available to um, small share rural farmers in India, right? So that's great. But then if you go even further up the value chain, what does that mean to that woman farmer who's minding her, her farm, who's not having to run at night to fetch water for the children, who's not getting raped while she's running, you know, to do what she needs to do, and so her children are healthier, they're getting educated, and all of a sudden the GDP of the country goes up, right? So there's that whole kind of chain of impact. It's really hard to do that. But right now, that's, that's, those are the frameworks that people are trying to put in place. For Cornerstone, much easier, right? We build a company, 
How many jobs can I create in the field of impact investing? How much money can I move towards impact? So for us, the measure, you know, this is a very complicated example, very simple example. What we do um, at our firm is, again, we like that word, that framework, access. So as an investor, where do you want your money to go? Do you want to allow for more access to education, more access to water? Where, where do you want to go? Access to capital. By the way, does everyone know that about 1.5%, just 1.5% of all venture capital money goes to women? That's it. And if we're talking about African-American women, then we're basically talking about zero from a quantitative level, right? I mean, those statistics are shocking, especially because the success rate for women entrepreneurs is way higher than men. But access to capital is a biggie. So access is what we use to make the sustainable development goals achievable in a human way. But there's no clear answer for it. And when it comes to the public markets, public companies, because we don't have standards for disclosure yet, all right, for the measures and metrics that they're reporting, um, it's even more challenging. We're getting those, they're coming, but not yet. So this is a newer part of the, you know, the equation. Is that helpful? Okay. Anything else? Yes, sir. Yeah. So it's interesting, when we talk about long-term stock exchanges, when we talk about uh, things like loyalty shares, when we talk about B Corp, okay, I actually have kind of mixed feelings about that. Um, because I personally think that the structures and functions that we have in place now for capitalists, for entrepreneurs, all right, who really have purpose-driven companies, I actually don't know if you need those functions. I think it helps. It helps raise consciousness and everything else. We chose, even though my attorneys created the public benefit corporate form, we chose to be a C-Corp. And so, just like I feel when you put um, ESG analysis on a sidecar or as an overlay to other investing, that kind of um, bifurcation kind of bothers me. So with regard to those structures, um, I'm not a huge fan. I want to see us do it right from the start. The incentives associated with short-term performance really is problematic, but I have really mixed feelings about that. Is that, is that fair? It, and there's no question, it's hugely challenging. But I also know activist investors who are actually very long-term oriented, very thoughtful, and are genuinely working um, for the betterment of the company, right? So, I mean, there, there's, no, there's no protection in the final analysis if you're not transparent about what you're trying to do for the company and you're not able to sell what you're doing. I mean, no question, activist investing is challenging and problematic. But I, 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 don't, I don't think different kinds of share classes or exchanges, um, I just personally don't think they're the answer for the long run. All right, but again, I'm, I have mixed feelings about it, I get it. Longer conversation, yeah. And by the way, most investors unfortunately don't vote their proxies, which really stinks. Because if they did, if everybody was doing active ownership, which our managers do, again, it would be a little bit less of a problem. Right? Anything else? We're good. Thank you, everybody. I'll see you afterwards.